The car industry has put out its fair share of winners. Think Porsche 911, Toyota Corolla, Ford F-150, and many more. We love them. We talk about them. But we've also witnessed many failed attempts that the industry would like us to forget. Well, let me remind you of those. Hey guys, I'm Stipe, and this is my list of the worst failed cars ever. But first, check out my Ridge Wallet, made of forged carbon fiber. That's the same material you'll find in the Sesto Elemento. Like the Lambo, it's light, sleek, and beautifully machined. They say that it'll last you a lifetime. Doesn't fold or bulge either, unlike my old wallet, which is crap. The Ridge takes all my cards and the cash, but it doesn't take up all the space in my pants. Finally! If you are also interested in a great slim wallet, you'll be happy to hear that the Ridge offers other colors and other supercar materials too, like aluminum, OG carbon fiber, or burnt titanium. Oh, that's odd. So go to ridge.com slash topcars and use the code topcars to get 10% off your order. You'll also get free shipping no matter where you are in the world and 45 days to test drive it. If you don't like it, you'll get your money back. That's like the best deal ever. Ridge.com slash topcars. Get your supercar wallet today. Number 7 the idea of having a luxury truck is as stupid as having ice cream made of mustard, and yet Lincoln thought, hmm, people will like this. It started as a Ford F-150 Supercrew, but then to make a Lincoln Blackwood more luxurious and less utilitarian, they shredded away anything that would make this truck even remotely useful. The total payload capacity was only 1,200 pounds, and that accounts for passengers too. The rear-wheel drive was the only choice, and then there's the whole flatbed shenanigans. Those pinstripes are supposed to remind me of a business suit, but they don't. The factory-installed non-removable hardcover makes this a trunk, and for some unexplained reason, the gate splits open right across the middle, revealing the inside, which is covered with plush carpets, brushed aluminum, and strip club lights. Okay, I get it. It's not meant to haul manure, but what's it for then? At least with the Navigator, you can get a full-height trunk, which can also double in size by lowering the rear seats, but this... Please, someone tell me how this is not just a regular sedan with some terrible handling characteristics. And oh, wait until you hear how much they asked for it. $53,000. That's over $70,000 in today's money. And I'm sorry, but there aren't enough stupid people with so much money laying around for this to be a success story. No wonder the Blackwood was killed off after just one year in production. Number 6. In the 80s, Japanese cars were taken over the world by storm. They were cheap to buy, cheap to run, and more reliable than anything else on offer, which is great for the sort of person who just wants to go places, hassle-free. But then the EU stepped in, and in a bid to protect their own auto industry, imposed huge tariffs on the Japanese imports. France even went so far as to ban them entirely, and as for Italy, well, they formed an alliance with Japan. again. The Italian government, who at the time owned Alfa Romeo, struck a deal with Nissan to build a great new car for the European market. This half-Alfa, half-Nissan would be the thing of dreams. Imagine a car oozing with Italian passion and flair for design and Japanese obsession with quality. That would have been the best thing since the invention of the wheel, probably. Sadly, they did it the other way around. The so-called Arna was a body of a Nissan Jerry put together in Italy and then given the engine, transmission, and electronics from the dreaded Alpha Sud. Can you imagine anything worse than that? The result was a car with Alpha's terrible mechanical issues, bad quality control, and electronics that needed an exorcism, but at least it had the style and grace of Nissan Cherry. Needless to say, the buyers didn't bite, and after four years in huge losses, both Carr and the Alliance were dead. Good. Number 5 when BMW and Volkswagen decided to revive Rolls and Bentley, the folks at Mercedes got worried. Up until then, the S-Class was the best car in the world simply because those two were outdated and unreliable relics from the past. But that was about to change. Not to be outshined, Mercedes fired back by bringing back the Maybach name, a luxury brand that no one under 90 has ever even heard of. A billion dollars later, and we got these two, Maybachs 57 and 62. The biggest, longest, most luxurious, and most over-engineered German cars, which no one wanted. While Rolls and Bentley were setting new sales records, Maybach struggled and went out of production after just 10 years and 3,000 cars sold. 
Why? Well, because it was still in S-Class. Despite changing the design of each body panel to look different, it didn't look different enough. It just looked like an uber-luxurious version of the existing Merc, which it was. And that's simply not enough to compete with the bespoke handmade British rivals with such rich histories. Another reason for failure was the Maybach name. It doesn't mean anything to anyone. This was a long-dead brand that was relevant only in 1920s Germany, and might as well have called it the Jeff. To illustrate just how big of a failure this whole project was, just think about this. Despite costing up to half a million, Mercedes still lost 450000 on every Maybach they sold. That had to hurt. Number 4 The Pontiac Aztec wasn't a bad car. No, really. It was just so ugly that no one ever had a chance to realize this. Basing it on the minivan U platform was a bit of forward thinking on Pontiac's side. This made Aztec cheaper to make, lighter, and it handled much better on the road compared to all the truck-based SUVs of the time. It was also highly versatile and chock full of cool ideas, like the armrest fridge that you can carry with you, or the cup holders in the tailgate, or the radio controls in the trunk. There was a lot of thought that went in this car. Too bad it was ugly. When GM asked the focus group what they think of the Aztec, one person said that they wouldn't want it even if it was a gift. And I don't blame that person. Just look at it. It looks like an angry kitchen appliance, or something dogs would bark at. When this thing rolls through the neighborhood, mothers drag their children inside. What's worse is the Aztec was clearly aimed at the Gen X youngsters, the cool and adventurous kind, the one that would have thousands of Instagram followers, if Instagram was a thing back then. Yeah, nah. It didn't appeal to them at all. In its five years of production, the Aztec never managed to sell enough just to break even, let alone make a profit. And when it went down, it soon dragged the entire Pontiac brand with it. Number 3 Throughout most of its history, Cadillac has been the pinnacle of American luxury on wheels. Refined, comfortable, and gigantic, they were the vehicles of choice for the glamorous world of business and entertainment. But by the 80s, loyal Caddy customers were also entering their 80s, Lovely. so GM started to look for a new kind of buyer, the younger kind that liked a bit of sportiness too, something that the compact German cars were offering. To rival the BMW 3 Series and Merc 190e, Cadillac committed the worst case of platform sharing and badge engineering ever. They based their sporty and luxury compact on GM's J platform, which was used for the absolute cheapest models available. The result was the Cimarron, a car that looked very much like the entry-level Chevy Cavalier. And thanks to the shared 88-horsepower four-banger and front-wheel drive, it drove like one too. Other than the slightly changed front and leather interior, the Cimarron still felt like a cheap Chevy with zero sporty potential, and yet Cadillac had the audacity to charge double for it. What? It didn't work. The new kind of buyers ignored it, and the old loyal ones hated it for ruining their favorite brand. Hell, even Cadillac was somewhat embarrassed by the Cimarron, since they didn't want to include it in the model range brochure. I think that says it all. Number 2 The early 80s were tough times in the USA. Because of the politics in the Middle East, oil prices went up, followed by inflation and a rise in unemployment. People looked for a cheaper way of life, and that led them to this, the Yugo GV. Heavily marketed as the successor to the T-Model and Volkswagen Beetle, this import from communist Yugoslavia was the cheapest new car in the USA with a retail price of just $3,990. People were lining up around the block to get their hands on this one, so the sales were pretty good, but three years later, the hype had died, just like many of the Yugos, too. There was a reason this car was so cheap. It was crap. The Yugo was actually a rebadged version of the Fiat 127, which at the time was already 15 years old. Then it was built in an old weapons factory, which was run by not the most capable CEO, but the one with the best connection to the ruling party. As a result, the Yugo was badly built, with bad safety ratings, bad emissions, prone to breakdown, outdated, slow, used a surprisingly large amount of fuel, and it turned into the butt of many jokes for years to come. Even the name was a joke. The GV thing? That stood for good value. <laughs> it wasn't. Number 1 If you thought that the Kami Yugo was a failure, wait until you see what capitalism gave us. The Pinto. 
It was a Ford's nervous response to the rise in popularity of the import subcompact cars, and it was a completely botched job. Pinto was developed in a rush, at a budget, and as a budget car. The corners were cut wherever possible, and if some faults were discovered during the planning phase, Ford ignored them because ain't nobody got time for that. When it was released, the Pinto was a huge success, managing to sell over 300,000 units in the first year alone. The sales continued strongly until it was discovered that the Pinto has a habit of exploding when rear-ended. Ford placed the fuel tank right behind the rear bumper, which would, in the event of a crash, be pushed forward and puncture the tank. It was estimated that 500 people died due to this flaw. But what's worse is how Ford handled the controversy. They figured it would be cheaper to settle all the lawsuits than to recall every Pinto and spend $11 fixing each car. But the accusations and criminal charges just kept piling, and the Blue Oval reputation plummeted. In the end, Ford had to pay way more than expected in punitive damages. Plus, they were also forced to do a recall, which at the time was the biggest one in automotive history. It was a failure of epic proportions. But of course, there are many more. Can you guess these three? Did you guess them? What are the other failed cars that you can think of? Write them down in the comments, vote for which topic you like to see next, and I'll see you in the next one.